Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you wherever you are in the world. Firstly, I would like to thank MSI Global for inviting me to speak at this very important event. My role is to share with you some of the big scenarios that are emerging for how things might play out in the next few years. Secondly, to look at some of the resulting shifts we might see in the business environment in particular. And finally, to look at what the implications might be in terms of leadership priorities for yourself as you look to navigate the environment and create new opportunities. And I think the first place to, to start is to look at what the implications might be for the way ourselves and our clients might be crafting strategy. And what we see is three key strategic focus points now. The first is around the next three months to make sure we're viable and resilient and really putting in place the operational procedures and practices to make sure we can navigate what's coming next. Secondly, it's about understanding how the way business is done in every sector and the rules of the game are changing and making sure we're doing the product process and marketplace innovation to both tap into what's changing, but also to create new opportunities. And finally, we have now been really awoken to the idea that massive shifts are taking place. Pretty much every industry sector is going to be reinvented, including professional services. So we need to think long and hard about how do we change what we do? How do we rethink our operations? How do we help clients do that? And how do we create new business models around those shifts? And that allows us to create some scenarios about how things might play out in our local markets and to also explore what that means that we need to be doing in the next 12 months or so to be developing the mindsets, the skill sets and the competencies as an organization to be able to respond to whatever might happen next. And what we know is when we think about what's next, there are multiple forces at play and multiple possible outcomes. And the challenge here is how do we make sense of all this? And one of the tools to help us do that is scenario planning. That allows us to think about what are the most important driving forces around which there's the greatest uncertainty and then how might they interact and play out? And then how do all the other forces play out in each of these different scenarios? And for us, we believe the two most important driving forces are firstly, the potential evolution of the pandemic and secondly, what happens in terms of the economic recovery. And, and the power of scenarios is that we're not trying to choose the scenario we like best. Most of us naturally would move towards hope and renewal. The challenge is really to think about what would we do under any one of these scenarios and to be prepared for all of them and to recognize that in the worst case scenario, some of the best opportunities arise. So let's have a look at these four scenarios in greater detail. The first we're calling uncharted territory, and this is where the pandemic really doesn't come under control for a long time, and the economic recovery is really quite slow and painful. And if we look at the pandemic, in this scenario, what we're saying is we might get a vaccine by the middle of next year, but it will be less than 50% effective in its first form, and it will take maybe two or three years or more to get the planet fully vaccinated. And what we know is that this, vac this virus travels around the world in seat 42C of an aircraft. And so whilst any country is at risk, we're all at risk. And because of that, what we see is that some businesses will still do well. We've seen in e-commerce in 90 days, the kind of growth was projected to take 10 years. So we know some businesses are going to do very well, but a lot will struggle. And because the pandemic will keep coming in, in waves in this scenario, what we'll see is in each round, more and more economic shocks, and then the impact of greater automation coming in, which makes it very hard for many businesses, sectors, and economies to recover properly, whilst others might do very well. So we can see that countries like Taiwan, New Zealand, and Vietnam, which have had a very rigorous process for managing the pandemic, are coming out of it stronger economically, and much more able to move forward, whereas others, have been hit by a 10 to 20% reduction in their GDP, and it will take them a long time to recover. And we're seeing certain sectors really being hit very, very hard, like hospitality and tourism. And those could take a long, long time. We know, for example, the airline industry is saying 
that it might take until 2024 to get to something like 80% of the passenger numbers they were seeing in 2019. And we've seen the impact of that. So we know that this is a very messy scenario, some great growth opportunities, but are also a lot of challenges. And, and the question for ourselves is, what would we do if we knew this was going to happen? What, what tactics would we adopt? What markets would we go after? What capabilities would be built? The second scenario is one which many people think we're in now, which is called Rocky Road. And that's where we don't get the pandemic under control. We have localized lockdowns, as we're seeing in many countries, various rules in place to try and control it, but also trying to move the economy forward. And we see growth in certain sectors. We see encouragement to get things moving in certain sectors, but a continuous round of business failures as other sectors like hospitality are restricted in terms of what they can do. The third scenario is one which we call healthy but hurting. This is where, in effect, we do get the pandemic under control over the next couple of years, but at the cost of the economy. Countries accept that they have to slow things down and really put health first and particularly put investment into developing nations to help them build up their health infrastructure. This has a knock-on impact across the globe. But what it means is that when we do start to recover late 2022, 2023, uh, we're much more robust. We know that we've got the pandemic under control. We have effective vaccines in place, effective cures in place. And so we know we're not going to go back into the kind of lockdown situation. And the final one, uh, which is called hope and renewal, is one where we do get a successful vaccine next year. And by the end of the year, hopefully something like 30 to 40 percent are vaccinated. And hopefully by the end of 2022, we have very effective vaccines out there that uh, impact more than 50 percent of the population in a positive way. And where the bulk of the global population have at least had one round of vaccination. In this scenario, what drives growth is government support for the growth of new sectors, green new sectors, encouragement for new ventures in many sectors, support for localized development of manufacturing industries to avoid supply chain risks, investment in the new skills for the industries of tomorrow, incentives for businesses to invest and create jobs, and a real focus on building for the future. So not only are we helping to recover from the shocks, but we're also laying the foundations for future growth. Now, as I said, the challenge here is not to pick the scenario we like best and focus on that, but to think about each of these scenarios and what would we do if any one of these happened? What strategies would we adopt? What tactics would we adopt? Which markets would we go after? And what do we need to start doing now? Because as I said, in, in some cases, in the worst case scenarios, that's where some of the biggest opportunities arise. And some of the biggest businesses of today uh, have actually been born in recessions. So in that context, what are some of the big shifts that are taking place? And I'd like to look at 10 critical ones for this industry. The first is really about reimagining what professional services it might look like in a world that's transitioning so fast and we have a rapidly changing reality. And I think most important in this world is really around how we change the model in professional services to make sure we're unleashing the entrepreneurial talent in our firms. There are so many growth sectors, there are so many new businesses coming that our top professionals don't have the time to go and do the business development or the research for all those sectors. So this is where we need to be unleashing our talent to be going out there and investigating the new opportunities in the, in the billion dollar and trillion dollar industries of the future and helping them to go out and do business development, supporting them and creating the right environment for them to do business development. If you look at a lot of the younger people in our firms, then they have many, many friends who are starting new ventures. Those could be potential clients for many of our firms, whether it's legal, financial or, or, or consultancy but we need to support them in doing that kind of business development. We also need to be thinking about the capabilities internally, how we communicate, how do we have dialogue, what new approaches can we use to help share ideas quickly. And what we're seeing is with more and more of us doing our work online, we need some additional tools to just the video conferencing platforms. And we're seeing this range of collective intelligence tools that emerge that allow us to share multiple perspectives. Our clients are embracing them. We need to understand them so we can embed them 
in the way we work with clients and the way we work internally. Secondly, I think what the pandemic has shown us is that many of us weren't so well prepared. And now we really need to understand for our clients and ourselves, how do we become better prepared for a range of shocks and a range of developments and a range of opportunities? We can't prepare for every individual opportunity, but we can prepare for the kinds of impacts we might have. So what are the, it doesn't matter what, but what are the things that might shape future opportunities. And if we see a massive growth in opportunity, how might we respond to it? Irrespective of what changes happen, what if they effectively reduce the size of our market overnight by 50% or demand by 50%? What if a competitor came to market with opportunities and new service lines that undercut us by 50%? And really doing that thinking on a continuous basis about how do we prepare for these new shocks, these new opportunities? And doing the same with our clients, because that becomes a very important revenue stream for us in helping them prepare for those shocks. In order to do that, we really need to focus on building foresight as a core competence to be able to think about what might be coming next and after that. And also really putting learning at the heart of our agenda and individual ownership of our own learning to make sure we're constantly learning about what's changing in the world and also the skills to help the firm develop new propositions and to help our clients use those propositions to navigate an uncertain future. One of the biggest areas that I think we really need to master is how quickly many fields of science and technology are evolving. They're growing at an exponential pace. And this creates really interesting opportunities both to birth new industries and to change existing ones, to change the way things are delivered by ourselves and by our customers, to, to change the business models we might use. So really getting our heads around these, what are the legal implications of using radical new technologies like AI to make important decisions as in the legal environment? What are the implications of creating new molecules that can clean up the environment, but also carry with them a huge risk if they don't succeed? So we start to see that with many of these new science and technology developments, they create a consulting opportunity, they create a financial services opportunity, an accounting opportunity, a risk opportunity, and a legal opportunity. And the best ones create all three. And what we can see is that the most important of these areas right now is digital. We know that the five biggest companies in the world are all technology companies. And last year, we saw Apple, Amazon, and Microsoft all cross the trillion dollar valuation threshold. This year, we've seen Apple at some points going above $2 trillion. Now, just to put that in context, if you add all together, all these companies like Bank of America, Hilton, Ford, Disney, and all these other companies you see on the screen, you still don't get to one Amazon or one Apple or one Microsoft. And that's incredible in terms of the market power these companies have. We know digital is penetrating every sector of business, of industry. It's changing the way we live. It's changing the way we work. So it becomes really important that we understand how digital is changing everything our clients are doing, is changing the way we are delivering services now and could be delivering services and what's coming more next with digital. We can't compete with these players in terms of digital capability, but what we can do is to make sure we have the digital literacy to understand the technologies and help our clients make the right choices and make sure internally we're making the right choices in terms of the systems we're delivering. One of the key ones here is artificial intelligence. And there are seven stages in the evolution of artificial intelligence from basic robotic process automation, which we're seeing where individuals are starting to automate their tasks. And we have expert systems doing mortgage calculations, making legal decisions, right the way through to what's called level five artificial general intelligence, which could create systems that are as smart as humans in every domain. I believe that this is moving so fast with China pouring $430 billion of investment into AI that by 2025, we will see AI systems that are as smart as 80% of us 80% of the time. And we'll take them for granted in our mobile phones, in our desktop applications, in everything we do. And then we would move to what's called artificial super intelligence, which is creating AI that's smarter than us and starts to solve some of our biggest challenges like food distribution, curing hunger, tackling climate change, doing these things in a way that we can't even imagine today because we don't have that level of intelligence. 
And then that would create what's called level seven, which is the singularity, where AI works out how to connect our ideas, connect our dreams, share our thoughts directly on the internet. Now that might not be happening for 20 years, but if we understand the direction of travel, we understand how important it is to master artificial intelligence and have a deep understanding. And we're working increasingly with clients in every sector where the first thing they're doing is to say, rather than having fact-free discussions about what AI can do, let's make sure that everyone has a basic understanding of the fundamentals. And we're seeing more and more organizations insisting that management, leadership, and every level of the organization go through this free set of learning modules called the Elements of AI from the University of Helsinki as, as a six module training in what AI basics are about so that everyone understands them and can have a, a better start point when we talk about what we could do with AI or how AI might impact our clients and start to do more progressive experiments with it. All those science and technology developments are also creating some very interesting possibilities in our world. They're creating the next wave of trillion dollar industries, moving us towards an abundance where, for example, vertical farming might give us virtually free food. Hyperloop transport might give us virtually free transportation. The internet and next generation technologies give us almost free distribution of information and communications. So these industries are creating potential abundance. They're also changing the way we think about the future. What we know is that in the recent pandemic and the current pandemic, it's disrupted supply chains. And many countries are saying, look, we need to localize manufacture more of the critical things that we need to buy. This creates a phenomenal opportunity for local businesses to start setting up manufacturing in all of the critical areas. And it creates a tremendous opportunity for yourselves to think about how do we take these big ideas and help local players apply them. It's no longer the case that you have to be a big company to use AI or synthetic bi biology or to play in any one of these fields. The technologies and the science is moving so fast that we can create small localized opportunities, which are great, again, are beneficial across everything we do in the, in the practices of, of the business across the world. We also know that we're at a point in time where every country is struggling to work out how it navigates through the pandemic and beyond. Some are really struggling under a level of debt that might be unsustainable, so we could see country failures. We're seeing radically different national economic strategies being adopted here in the UK. We have tried to bail out both companies, we try to provide support to individuals. Different countries around the world have had their own models for that. But some are seeing their debt ratings downgraded quite dramatically. This is driving all sorts of things. And one in particular is governments outsourcing a lot of the requirements they need at speed. So in the UK, for example, Deloitte are providing over 1,100 consultants on one project for the government around the track, trace and testing systems. Now you think about the value of that to their business, 1100 consultants at maybe 1500 pounds a day, that's over 1.5 million pounds in revenue per day. So starting to think about where is government outsourcing, where are the next range of opportunities, how do we gear up to service those? But also we're seeing that in every market, firms are starting to struggle, more and more M&A opportunities coming, firms are looking for exits, again, creating M&A opportunities, Firms are looking to accelerate their growth because of uh, the economic opportunities of some people struggling. We're also seeing a lot of firms trying to refinance themselves and needing new financial engineering situations. And then inevitably in any downturn, we see a lot of contractual litigation as people try and get out of their contracts for supply, for uh, their rent and whatever. So th these are all creating really interesting opportunities for us as a firm and there's a global network of firms. And the question is, how well are we understanding those opportunities and positioning to really move into them? How well are we sharing ideas and practices across the firm for how we respond to a changing marketplace? We also know that the disruption has only really started. Things like artificial intelligence and automation and blockchain are going to radically disrupt many, many sectors. And we know that this could lead to unemployment in the short term, restructuring of industries, new skills to support new industries, new investment in the industries of the future. 
But it also means that governments are going to have to come up with schemes to support the transition. Here in the UK, we provided a guaranteed basic income for over 9 million people during the lockdown. That's effectively a first step towards guaranteed basic incomes and services. And I think we'll see more and more of this. And it will be professional service firms who are asked to help model what this could look like, understand the legal implications and design how the solutions might work, how the payment mechanisms might work, how the clawbacks might work. Do we really want to give these guaranteed incomes to people earning over a million euros a year? So we're going to be in an interesting opportunity market here as many, many countries start to wrestle with these ideas. We also know that decentralized solutions and decentralized finance are becoming more and more central. Already the global crypto economy is worth $350 billion. And we're seeing in every sector of industry and in every uh, sector of professional services from legal to audit and accountancy to consultancy, blockchain-based solutions emerging, decentralized solutions emerging. Every aspect of financial services, of corporate finance, we're seeing new propositions emerging. And this creates three big opportunities for us. Firstly, to help, help our clients understand, evaluate, and apply these, these solutions. Secondly, to look at where we might adopt such solutions in our own practice to give ourselves an edge. And thirdly, where we might want to start developing such solutions to take them to marketplace and create new service offerings. And I'm sure as we look across the piece in MSI, some of your practices are already working on all three areas. The question is how quickly are you sharing that knowledge between you and your learning from helping clients with these solutions? The next big area that I think is important is that we recognize that in a world of turbulence, pretty much every business sector is being transformed and the business of business and the business of professional services are changing. All of these developments in marketplaces in consumer behavior and business behavior in technology, in the way we source finance, they're all changing at the same time, which is going to give rise to some very different operating models. I'll give you one simple example. This is a company from Italy called Earthbuy, who are making a new 100% biodegradable bioplastic. And in order to do this, they're, they're doing three very interesting things. Firstly, deep, deep collaboration with academic R&D partners across every aspect of what they do in biology and chemistry and industrial engineering to come up with new solutions that are cost effective, fast and scalable for the world they're moving into. Secondly, they're using blockchain technology to monitor the entire production process because safety, visibility and reliability are so key. And thirdly, they're tapping into a whole new range of financing instruments, again, based on crypto tokens, cryptocurrency and blockchain. So they're pulling them together into a new design model, a new operating model and a new financial model. And I think there'll be more and more of this. And this, again, creates legal audit and accountancy, financial engineering and consultancy opportunities for firms across uh, MSI International. And that, so internationally, and that I think is something that you can collaborate on, but also make sure that you're talking to your clients to understand the new thinking they're doing about their own business and the future of their sector. The next area is about recognizing that not everyone wants to play the game anymore. Some people are looking at the scale of change and saying, I want out. Uh, I want to get out of this business or I want to leave the firms I'm in. And that, I think, is going to create a very interesting opportunity around helping businesses exit their sector or exit their owners exit their business in a way that's beneficial to them, coming up with the most creative solutions. And also, as people want to leave our firm or others, what are those innovative ideas for how we help people leave in a way that makes them raving fans of the business they're leaving or the practice they're leaving within MSI. So really starting to think about that almost as a new service opportunity around people exits and a creative opportunity around business exits. And finally, we're in a world where global sustainability, inclusivity, mental health are becoming more and more important. And this is no longer something that's nice to do. We know of professional services firms who've lost major bids 
and also won them based on their sustainability credentials, based on how well they're targeting certain aspects of the sustainable development goals that you see on the screen, based on their policies around inclusivity and diversity, based on how they're tackling mental health in the workplace. And what we see now is huge shifts in the expectations and demands of clients, of markets, of governments, and of citizenry. So making sure we're truly understanding that in local markets and then saying, in our strategies, what are we doing to make progress on these things? And which of the key sustainable development goals are we really prioritizing as individual firms and as a global network to show that we're making a real difference and that our commitment isn't just at the firm level, but is something that enables individual employees to really make feel like they're making a big difference. So we've, we've toured some of those big scenarios and big shifts taking place. Now let's close by looking at what are some of the leadership priorities that come out of this. And the first thing we see is that whether it's with client firms or with professional service firms that support them, the same thing comes out when we do leadership strategy workshops and, and business strategy workshops. And that normally comes out in the first few hours of talking about the future. It's four issues. One is we don't have the time or the money or the market insight to know where to focus to find the next wave of opportunities, the next billion dollar, $10 billion, $100 billion or trillion dollar sectors. How do we find where the growth is for now and next? How do we allocate the right resource to understanding that and going after it before our competitors? So that's one piece. The second is pretty much every organization we talk to is trying to do too much and discovering their resources are spread too thinly. So how do we get really good at prioritization, picking the vital few initiatives that we want to make progress on, moving those forward, stopping the projects where we're not making progress for some reason, canceling projects quickly where we're spending money and suddenly we're seeing free alternatives emerging over the internet and really constantly aligning what we're doing with the changing needs of customers. The third, every organization I talk to has the same issue, which is around technology, that our technology doesn't allow us to do what we need to do. We don't have a single source of data, which means we don't have the insight we need. And our challenge back to the organization is, well, why not? Why aren't you making the tough decisions to create a single source of truth with your data? and a single consolidated database because without it, you cannot compete in a world that's becoming totally digitally centric. And secondly, what are those critical applications you need to be building and how do you change the way that you build them so you can build them iteratively and faster and keep evolving them. And finally, every organization says it doesn't have the right capabilities. That's totally in the gift of leadership. What are we doing to accelerate that? The second big area, I think that's really important is making sure that we don't just do horizon scanning and scenario planning once a year, but we build it into all of our teams. And across all our practice areas, we are developing those horizon scans of what might be coming to impact our area. What are the known developments, the known trends? What are the weak signals of change? And what are the really wild ideas that could impact us? And then what do our one to three year roadmaps look like? And what are we doing to make sure we're embedding resilience and embracing it for each of our practice areas? And finally, to make sure we're also helping our clients do this. I think this is one of the biggest growth opportunities in terms of what clients need for the future. In order to enable us to do this, we need to build new skills across the practice. Yes, we can develop certain skill programs and training for our staff. But I think we're at the point now where everyone needs to take personal responsibility for their own learning, their own skill development, and increasing their own digital literacy. And the great thing is there are many free resources. I talked about elements of AI, but you can go to big universities like Harvard, and their Harvard X program allows you to take almost any course for free. You only pay for the certification. We're seeing an incredible array of videos online now that tell us about all sorts of developments in the world, how people are tackling grand challenges, the emergence of new industries, what new technologies look like and what they might make possible, new business model ideas. And the great thing is most of these videos on websites like Futurism, Cheddar, Interesting Engineering, the World Economic Forum and so on, 
These videos are between one and five minutes in length. So everyone can spend 10 minutes a day just getting two or three new ideas, sharing them with their friends and colleagues and gradually accelerating our understanding of a changing world and making sure we're constantly immersing ourselves in new ideas and possibilities. And really, we need to be talking about two different types of skills. On the left of the screen, you see the, the personal self-management skills that we all need to help us navigate the world, to maintain our balance, to maintain our perspective and to enable us to sort of stay calm under pressure, to stay focused and to rise above the noise. On the right hand side of the screen are the more technical skills that enable us to solve problems faster, to look at the big picture, to see how interconnected ideas are changing and to enable us to apply these in almost any context alongside the technical skills, whether they be in relative relation to legal or tax or some area of advisory work. So we've gone through quite a rapid exploration of four scenarios that could emerge and the importance of preparing for all four scenarios rather than just picking the one we like best. Secondly, we've looked at 10 big shifts shaping our environment, all of which are creating fascinating opportunities across all of the practice areas of our businesses. And finally, we've looked at a set of key leadership priorities to make sure that we're putting ourselves in the best position to learn fast, rationalize our initiative and agenda to enable us to focus, understanding how our world is, cha is changing and prepare ourselves for any possible eventuality. We're in a world where all of us are at the position we're in because we got very good at learning certain dance steps. If there was a downturn, we knew how to deal with the downturn. If there was a sudden shock to our industry, we navigate that. If customers' demands changed, we knew how to navigate that and dance around each of those problems. But now everything is happening together. We have a perfect storm of change, the pandemic, the economic downturn, rapidly changing customer demands, an increasingly virtual workforce, and really disruptive technology all coming at the same time. Dramatically changing clients, dramatically changing the way they do business, and creating incredible new opportunities. So our challenge is to give ourselves permission to let go of some of the dance steps that no longer work because the music has changed and start to learn new dance steps and give ourselves permission to look a little bit awkward and make some mistakes until we master those dance steps. I think this is a crucial time for an organization like yourselves to really start to experiment and adapt to the world we're moving into to acquire those new skills and to make sure that the door to the future is firmly open. So I hope this session has made sense. I hope it's given you some real inspiration for how to tackle the future. And we now have some time for questions. But before we do that, I just want to share with you something that I hope will be useful. We've agreed with your colleagues at MSI Global to make available for free our newsletter. This is normally $149 per year. But if you take a picture of what's on the screen, you go to the website and you enter that coupon code at checkout when you uh, sign up for the newsletter, you can have a copy of that for free for one year. And that newsletter provides a regular dose, if you like, of new insights, ideas, example videos, interesting thoughts and perspectives, insights into changing developments in our world, and hopefully a set of resources and inspirations to help you keep creating the future. And with that, I shall hand back now to take questions from the audience. Thank you.